it's good to be with you again to introduce to the world your new course, Ultimate Reality, God and Beyond. Yes. So we're intrigued to learn what is beyond God, even the Abrahamic God. <laughs> um, if you're here now live with us and you have a question for John on this course, then please just uh, let us know if you have any questions in the chat. We'll be here for maybe half an hour, then John has to uh, leave us again. Just to mention this briefly, enrollment for John's course is now open. You can follow the link in the description of this live stream to enroll now. We're beginning next week on Friday, the 5th of April. John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Johannes. Yes, I deliberately chose the title for two reasons. Uh, my first course with you was uh, Beyond Nihilism, and I wanted to pick up the theme. And part of what we got into Beyond Nihilism was Tillich and others talking about this God beyond God. It wasn't a central theme for that course, but it was raised. Um, and so for the people who took that course and want to follow up on that question, this course is on offer. But you don't have to have taken Beyond Nihilism to take this course. I've designed it so it's also completely standalone. And what do I mean by ultimate reality, God, and beyond? This has to do with ideas about trying to understand ultimate reality and whether or not categories that we have typically used to think about that, categories like person and substance, are the best categories for grasping ultimate reality. And I don't just mean intellectually, I mean coming into a relationship to it that is transformative and gives us some normative guidance in our life. And so in that sense, the ultimate becoming sacred for us. And it is my contention that we are witnessing an advent of the sacred. Uh, the sacred is trying to be reborn or disclose itself in a new way. Choose your language here. Um, that's why I choose the word advent. I'm trying to pick up on something slightly religious. And um, that, I believe, is in response to the widening and deepening of the meaning crisis. The words person and substance, in fact, go back to Greek philosophy. And in fact, they have, this, they have similar roots. And uh, this may surprise you. The original meaning of substance wasn't stuff like what we think of it today. That's a Cartesian innovation. The original meaning was that which is the subject of predicates. And a person is an example of that. So I can I can attribute things to Johannes. Johannes is handsome. Johannes is charming. Johannes is highly educated. But I can't treat Johannes as a predicate. Like this bottle is Johannes, right? Or something like that. It doesn't work. Um, and so the idea here is we tend to see the world, this was at least Aristotle's argument, and we then craft our logic in terms of subjects and predicates, where the ultimate reality are subst subjects, independently existing things that are the owner, uh, owners of properties and the generators of activity or action. And that is a prevalent and profound view. And one of the things I would argue is those notions of persons and person and a being an Aristotelian substance are bound up in our Abrahamic traditional notions of God. Now, two things about that. The first is, within those traditions, there have been ongoing profound mystical traditions that have questioned that and have talked about the ultimacy being a no-thingness in a profound sense. And this has come from a Neoplatonic tradition, and Neoplatonic Christianity is probably the backbone of Christian spirituality, as I think Neoplatonic Islam is the backbone of Sufi and so on for Judaism and many other religions. That is why one of the things we'll be reading is the work of James Filler. We won't be reading his beautiful, astonishing book because it's somewhat expensive. So instead, we'll be reading three papers that are available to you for free about this proposal that ultimacy is not to be understood as a thing, person, or substance, but as pure relationality. And in their sense, and in that sense, we can understand being as pure relationality and intelligibility as pure relationality, and we can finally get some sense 
of why they belong together, but in, in no way in which we can logically explain how they belong together. And of course, this goes back to Parmenides. As soon as you try and explain logically the relationship between intelligibility and being, you get into wonderful paradoxes and see Zeno, one of his most important disciples. Okay, so we know that there's, there's an important issue there. Filler's argument is that um, there's a way out of this by properly recovering that Neoplatonic tradition, and that would be the beyond God. And to be fair, Christians like Eckhart and Tillich have talked about the Godhood beyond God or the God beyond the God of theism. And so this is not something foreign to Western theological and mystical reflection. Of course, this is convergent, not identical, but convergent with proposals from uh, Asiatic philosophy, especially Zen, especially people trying to bridge between Zen and Western philosophy, the work of Heidegger. So uh, the first book we'll look at is right, The Nothingness Beyond God, An Introduction to the Philosophy of Nishida Kataro, who's one of the pivotal figures of the Kyoto School. And we'll see that he is not a mystic. He has mystical experiences because he's a Zen practitioner, but he's a thoroughgoing philosopher. He wants to create a logic that encompasses our, our, encompasses being and the no-thingness that is experienced within uh, Zen. And he does this in a very, very uh, logically rigorous fashion while still being very, very informed by spiritual practice and experience. And in that way, he reminds me of no one else, uh, uh, no one else but Plotinus, because uh, that's what you find in Plotinus, rigorous argumentation sewn together with spiritual exercise and informed by mystical experience. We're trying to get all the different channels by which have, people have tried to get a proper relationship to ultimacy and how they frequently are getting beyond the personal substantial God that has become the traditional way we understand the referent of the word God. We'll then move to somebody within the West, a fellow Canadian, oh, Canada, and uh, he's he, he describes himself as an atheist, uh, but his atheism isn't the kind of atheism you're going to find online because it's an atheism that also criticizes naturalism and an unquestioning allegiance to the dictates of science. And this, of course, is the work of J.C. Schellingberg, Evolutionary Religion. And I'll also be making use of two of his other books in the course. You don't have to read them. The Hiddenness Argument, of which he is the originator, and Religion After Science. Uh, the main point of his argument there is that science has opened up to us deep space and deep time in which we are faced with, I think is an undeniable fact, that the entire history of the Abrahamic religions is at most about 2,500 years old. Human beings have been religious for 40,000 years. Human beings have been around for 200,000 years. Hominid species have been around for 2 million years. And of course, it's plausible that we will, our species will exist for at least hundreds of thousands of years if we don't destroy ourselves. And so the little snippet of time and the little aspect of space that have been brought in by the Abrahamic religions should be called into question. We need to reformulate the framework at which we are trying to get to ultimate reality in terms of this deep time and deep space and the, the, the realities of evolution. And so he is going to propose that an imaginal understanding of faith and religion, and he's going to propose a what he calls the triple transcendent, that we are practicing an imaginal relation, not an imaginary, not an imaginary. We're practicing an imaginal relationship to the triple transcendent. And what he means by that, he means transcendent as the ultimate ground of being, transcendent as the ultimate source of norm normative guidance, and transcendence as that which is our most powerful source of transformation. And he's proposing an imaginal relationship to ultimacy so that we can seriously explore in a long-term game the 
real possibility of ultimacy being triply transcendent. And I think this is very pertinent to the advent of the sacred today. The third book we'll be looking at, and, and the fourth in the series, we will do Nishitani, then Schellingberg, then Filler, and then we will end with somebody from the Western tradition who is trying to bridge to the Asiatic tradition. Just like Nishitani was in Eastern philosophy and bridging to the West, we will return the favor and we will look at somebody who is uh, obviously trained within the Abrahamic religions. He's a Christian theologian, but he's also a profound Whiteheadian. And he uses that framework to try and get at um, something like the philosophical Silk Road. What is the through line between several conceptions of ultimacy from the West and from the East? He takes a look at Taoism, Vedanta, and Buddhism, such that we can see a convergence in an understanding of ultimacy. And you'll find that his argument is, ulti is also ultimately that ultimacy is that which is profoundly, primordially, dynamically relational in nature. And this is why some of the most prevalent icons for God, agape, logos, light, life, are all deeply, deeply, inherently relational in nature. And it is time that we woke up to this possibility so that we can more appropriately help awaken the advent and awaken to the advent of the sacred. At least that is what I feel called to. And I want to share this reflection with people dialogically. And I'm going to confess, I'm going to be using you as guinea pigs because this course is preparation for my next big series, Walking the Philosophical Silk Road, in which I will actually go on a pilgrimage to actual locations in order to enter into deep dialogue, immersive reflection in place, in situ, on many of these thinkers and try and realize, not just intellectually, propositionally, but with the whole of my psyche directed towards the whole of reality, that's why I think of it as a pilgrimage. What is going on right now and what is truly possible for us in a profound way of responding to the meaning crisis? So that's a, a quick overview of the course. Excellent. Thank you very much. So if anyone of you have any questions for Sean on this course, please let us know in the chat and we'll get to them in the end, let me just perhaps briefly explain what it means if when you enroll. So there are a couple of different tiers that you can choose from. If you click on the link in the description of this video, you'll find the enrollment page. You'll find all lecture and seminar dates. We'll be meeting Fridays from 6 to 8 p.m. UK time. That's 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you have to make sure that wherever you are in the world, we just had two Australians join us for the Plato course. So they were up at, I think, 4 a.m. Um, so let's see if we have, I think one person has enrolled from Australia, but to, only for the cell study tier. If you cannot make it to the live lectures, but you still like to learn, from John in this context, then the self-study tier is best for you. Gives you access to the recordings of the lectures by John Reveki and also the recordings of the seminar discussions. If you have time to join at least, let's say, five of the live lectures and seminars, then this might be best for you. And we have a couple more of the private one-on-one -on -one sessions with John as well. Now, uh, what happens at the live lecture seminars is we'll be meeting for two hours and for the first 45 to 60 minutes, John will teach. Sometimes he will go a bit over uh, as happened yeah. last time. <laughs> but, if, but if he does and it's a 70 hour lecture, then John is actually uh, <clears throat> very gracious uh, uh, with his time and stays on an extra 60 minutes. So it'll be a full hour for you to 
uh, discuss it. We'll first have a breakout session, about 10, 15 minutes each, which means that you will be breaking you up into smaller groups. These sessions are off the record. So you'll be in a group of maybe three to four people discussing what you just heard and what you've been reading. And when you come back, there's at least about 45 minutes or so with John Verveke uh, leading a group seminar, group discussion where you can ask your questions. And uh, so that's what happens at the live lectures and seminars. If you want to take private sessions, we've added um, two more then you could enroll in the dialogue session here. You can also just uh, select the payment plan. This is for the philosophical fellowship. So, okay, let me just uh, see if there are at this early hour questions. <laughs> okay, here's a question that's a bit uh, maybe... Uh, left field but um he is someone asking about how you view the faustian soul relating to your new course um i <laughs> try not to comment on things that i don't have very much knowledge of i'm not uh i do have not read faust and i've only read secondary material about faust in passing um i would need a little bit more about the faustian soul um, I've read a little bit around, about it uh, in work on the Promethean spirit, yeah. and Faustian soul and the Promethean spirit, and the, at the attempt to be sort of purely self-creative, and Hegel's critique of the Faustian soul as being inherently uh, self-contradictory, uh, because the attempt to fully create oneself uh, learns uh, just becomes an imprisonment in one's own impulsivity. And um, that is all I know. So uh, I only know sort of a Hegelian take on Faust in connection with the Promethean spirit. And whether or not that's a fair reading of Faust, I don't know. And so I'm just going to say that. Insofar as the Hegelian interpretation of the Faustian Geist, um, I think this is, in, in a sense, not, um, it's not that, it's not the attempt to free ourselves um, so that we can be compure, uh, purely self-creating in our spirituality, some kind of hyper-romanticism. It's not that at all. Um, in fact, it is about trying to find out the ways in which we are properly bound beyond an egocentric framework to deeper reality and what kind of real impact and transformative capacity that has for us, but not only for us, but also for how reality realizes itself, even independent of uh, human specific concerns. So I think in that way, it's not Faustian. And I think it's also part of a challenge of both the Enlightenment's Faustian or Promethean spirit, um, but also a challenge to what the Enlightenment was challenging. Uh, which is a, a view that these issues can be decided uh, primarily through um, some sort of de deference to traditional authorities. And so this means how do we get back properly the notion of legacy while opening to what Schellingberg is talking about? The problem with these traditions is they're at most two and a half millennia old and that is far, far too young to take into account our full spirituality and even more to take into account our attempts to get at ultimate reali reality. Like, really, think about it. Like, if you ask people, you know, how, you know, how much effort and what it'll take to get at sort of the quantum realm. And it's like, oh, yes, it's taken all of these years of science and all these equipment and all these people, and we're still so far, and we may never get it. And yes, that's right. But what about ultimate reality? Oh, well, my religion says this, blah, 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 blah. And it's like that, to my mind, bespeaks a lack of epistemic humility. That's Schellingbird's point. It's like, really? Shouldn't ultimate reality be our longest, deepest, hardest project? And that to which we should show both the deepest devotion, that's what the traditional religions got right, but also the most pronounced epistemic humility. And that is what 
the Enlightenment got wrong. It wasn't properly humble. It thought it could find the method by which all of reality could be calculated all at once. So I'm trying to challenge both of those in an integrated fashion. Here's a spicy question. <laughs> I thought the last one was fairly spicy. It was, <laughs> yeah. But this is beyond, nihilism does not sound blasphemous, well, okay. But beyond God does. Is this provocation intentional? And if not, how do you handle that connotation? So, it, I mean, the problem with the word blasphemy is it's equivocal. It has many different meanings. Um, many people think it's just simply arrogating oneself to being God. Uh, that's not. Uh, uh, earlier versions of blasphemy uh, were much more uh, synonymous with what we would now call sacrilegious, in which there is an improper regard for what is sacred and an undue um, uh, disregard for reverence. And then that got translated to God. And of course, the most extreme form of not proper regard to sacred or reverence is trying to arrogate oneself into God's status. Um, so if I take that to be the continuous meaning of blasphemy, and I've just made an argument for that, um, I'm not attempting to be anything, uh, do anything blasphemous at all. In fact, I am proposing, and by the way, many Christian mystics have done this, that the word God and our concept of God is blasphemous in the sense of being an idol that we fixate upon rather than what that we try to see through by means of and beyond. And in that sense, I'm actually trying to put myself in either even deeper service to the sacred and come into a more profound reverential relationship to it and to leave open to it how it might possibly disclose itself in our time in, in and in our crisis. And I think that is my response to the criticism that I'm engaging in blasphemy. The last thing, the last thing that John Braveke would want to engage in is blasphemy, idolatry, or being sacrilegious. So we invite um, people of all uh, walks of life and yes, so we want to if you are a firm believer, uh, if you're Jewish or a Muslim or a Christian uh, or not religious at all, yes, uh, it uh, you should come. We yeah. invite the challenge, but you should also be open to be challenged yourself uh, in this regard because uh, there's a place for open dialogue here. So we hope that you can join us. Here's another question if you have some some time, John. Um, I do, I do, Johannes. Uh, not, the other question I had, what place does Christianity, because this is in line with what we just said, this place does Christianity have in the space this cause explores, especially the Christianity you've come to know with Jonathan Peugeot? Yeah, I think that's a very well-placed question. Uh, and um, um, I'm going to tread very lightly here, and I'm going to ask for charity because I don't want to be playing favorites in the family argument between different Christian groups over who's the true Christian group or anything like that. I am not going to be, if you try to hold me to that, um, I won't do that. What I will say, what I have said, and this reflects a personal stance, is if I were to be Christian, I would be Eastern Orthodox, precisely because I think the Eastern Orthodox has kept alive in the Neoplatonic tradition in a way that I find uh, quite beautiful. James Filler argues that interpretations of the Eastern Orthodox Church Fathers like Dionysus and Maximus actually supports his argument of ultimate reality as pure relationality and that the Trinity properly understood is an icon by which we can see that God is ultimately relational in nature rather than substantial. And I think those of you who are committed to orthodoxy and therefore are committed to some view, uh, many of you, not all of you, are committed to some notion of the Trinity have to take Filler's argument seriously. What the heck is the Trinity doing if your ultimate reality is a single substance? The Trinity is showing that ultimate reality is inherently relational. It is one but it is not the one of a substance. It is the one of pure relationality. And I think Christianity, therefore, has an important role to play properly proportioned in the discussion about its understanding of ultimacy as the Trinity. I would hope 
and I think this is Filler's argument, that uh, this work would people help recover in Tolkien's sense of recovery, go to somewhere else, put on different glasses, and then come back to T.S. Eliot and see your Christianity again for the first time, see Jesus anew from the first time. I would hope that this would help you to recover your Christianity. I hope it would help you to recover your Buddhism, your Judaism, your Islam, your Unitarianism, right? Your secularity and find a sacredness that the evidence shows many secular people are craving even within your secularism. So that is my answer. I think Christianity has a proper place at the table and I do not see why this could not help people profoundly recover Christianity. However, it might also, I want to be honest, a portal swings both ways. And it might also be helpful to people who are needing to leave Christianity. And I think denying that people need to leave Christianity, uh, given my own personal experience and that of many other people, is an unjust and unfair to thing to do. So I hope my work might also help people who need to leave Christianity or need to leave Islam or need to leave Buddhism, by the way, and find where they are more appropriately situated so they can enter into a more profoundly deep and resonant relationship with what is ultimately real. Maybe one more? I'll take two or three more. I'm really okay. Okay, good. I'm enjoying the questions. I I'm hoping that this ex is exemplary of the kinds of questions we're going to get in the course, and I hope that I'm showing how I want to enter into a deep and uh, dialogical uh, response to your questions. Is it possible to accept relationality as the ultimate ground of being whilst rejecting mathematical realism and the claims of platonic form, specifically numbers as just human abstractions? Abstractions, sorry. Yes. So this is an important question. Um, and I'm working slowly and very intermittently. I'm working my way through uh, some of the philosophy of mathematics. Um, right now, my, my concern is around Quine's indispensability argument. And then uh, people like James Brown, also at U of T, oh, Canada, um, about um, whether or not mathematics requires Platonism. Um, and also some of the work, I forget the author, and I apologize for this. I have his book, and I've been starting to read it, Atheistic Platonism, uh, where he's basically arguing for something very similar to what I'm arguing for here, that Platonism doesn't commit you to theism. Um, now, whether or not, so just quickly, Quine's indispensability argument is that math is indispensable uh, to science, and that indispensability it, um, uh, would mean that there has to be some kind of reality to um Uh, mathematical entities, uh, because how could our access to reality via science depend on something that is not itself inherently real? You get into all kinds of performative contradictions. I think there's something in the indispensability argument. I think there is, uh, there. is, I've got the book, uh, The Academic Sin of Confusing Having a Book with Having Read the Book. I have a book on somebody who claims to have surpassed the indispensability argument, and I think... Um, I forget the name of the author, it starts with a B. His book, Platonism and the Objects of Science, makes a very strong argument for something beyond the indispensability argument about Platonism. Um, so I'm attracted to the idea that the mathematical entities have to be given some kind of non-nominalistic realness. Um, I'm not far enough along in the development of this argument to come to firm conclusions about it. I would like to reflect upon it. Um, the Neoplatonists, of course, pointed out quite rightly uh, that mathematical entities, if understood properly, are attempts to disclose the grounds of intelligibility and are therefore inherently purely relational in nature and that every theorem depends on every other theorem, and they form a, an integrated, interdefining set. In fact, Plotinus often uses the metaphor of the way different uh, mathematical theorems are interdefining and interpenetrating to talk about the interdefining, inherently relational existence of the forms. And this is a notion that I think you can argue, he would not want to argue this, 
but I would argue this, and James Filler would argue this, and other people, I think James Brown would argue this. Um, this is very different from many standard readings of Plato's idea of the forms, where the forms are somehow standalone entities. I think it's ambiguous in Plato uh, whether or not he thought of them as standalone or where, whether or not he thought about them as completely interdependent and interpenetrating and interdefining the way Plotinus clearly and explicitly does. Um, so depends what you mean by Platonism. <laughs> it always does though, right? Doesn't it always depend on what you mean by Platonism? And so I think the Neoplatonic understanding seems to be in line with what I'm reading about the indispensability argument and people going beyond the indispensability argument. And it's very different from standard notions of the platonic forms and mathematical numbers, for example. So that was a bit of a, um, not sure, thinking it about a lot, and here's some ideas. And some of my answers to your questions will be that. Some of my answers will be, not sure, don't have a clear answer. Here's how I'm thinking about it. Here's how I'm reflecting on it. This is the way in which my thinking is tending, but I'm very open to correction. Excellent. So just for anyone who's just joining now, because we now have 40 people here. Um, this live stream is on John Ravicki's new course, Ultimate Reality. And if you'd like to join us, live lectures begin next week. Uh, Zoom meetings is how we will hold the live lectures. So this won't be live on YouTube or anywhere else. This will be a closed seminar group of about 30 to 40 people, depending. And if you'd like to join us, the link to enroll is in the description of this video. So we hope that you can join us. Maybe let me just have a look at one more question. I, I'll take a couple more questions if you have any. <laughs> okay. I'm really enjoying this a lot. I want to thank everybody for these excellent questions. I hope that you feel that I'm treating them very responsibly and responsibly. Is it possible to have an approach to ultimate, to the ultimate or the divine, which is not idolatrous? Yes, um, that's, I think, sorry, my yes is good question, not, not the easy, yeah, of course. <laughs> what I meant by that is, I think this is a good question. Um, and this is why I want to explore the Zen perspective. And this is why I've been talking a lot about Zen Neoplatonism. Uh, for me, one of the core defining features of Zen is the living, continuous undermining of the human temptation towards idolatry. That is a way of understanding Zen. This is why Zen says, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. Because even the Buddha should not be turned into something that is identified with nirvana or with shunyata. And so this is why we're reading uh, Nishida, and it's also why we're reading Bracken, and it's also why we're reading Schellingberg. Schellingberg's big time perspective and perspective of ongoing li profound lived epistemic humility and imaginal relationship to the sacred is an ongoing avoidance of any cognitive closure, any affective finishing, completion, any perfect uh, claims of perfection um, on anything that is supposed to be um, the sacred and therefore disclose the divine or I, as I like to say better, dis disclose ultimate reality to us. Um, I think the way I would answer you is that any relationship to ultimate reality inherently puts us in danger of idolatry. And if we think we can come to a closure of statement, belief, or feeling, or identification, then I think we fall into idolatry. If we are open to a questioning that is always questioning itself and becomes a perpetual questing, which is what Zen strongly, strongly tries to educate us towards, then I think we don't have to fall into idolatry. Just uh, someone said, I very much appreciate your willingness to answer our questions, John, and the way in which you do so. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, really, I really appreciate that. That's very encouraging to me. I'm trying to, I want to try and find with all of your help a way to make my thinking and the thinking of others that I'm, teaching about accessible without removing the necessary challenge to transformation 
that is needed for a proper appreciation and understanding of their work. And this, this is a very tricky thing to do. And I appreciate um, the way people are being uh, helpfully responsive to my attempts to meet that important goal. This is the last question, and it has to do with what you just said, fittingly. How does the course deal with encouraging participants to change themselves and change in relationship to what? Uh, so I think what I would say is, this is a, I'm not going to be talking specifically about him, I, although he might come up in the course. This is Jacob Needleheim in his book, What is God? A book I seriously considered using for this course. Uh, but uh, you can't do all the books, um, right? Um, but it'll definitely come up in the, as the Silk Road. I, uh, I will put that as a recommended reading along the way. And I, oh, John, Johannes, I meant to say that to you. <laughs> well, there we go. Uh, what is God by Jacob Needleheim? Um, so, um, he makes the argument, which I think is deeply right, that as we try to come into a properly proportioned relationship to ultimacy, God, if you will, um, this requires a deeply transformative re-inhabiting, re-understanding, I almost want to coin a, a horrible word here, here a re-being of who we are and what it is to be a self and a person. And that is very much how anybody entering into this uh, will see um, how this course challenges you towards a transformation at a very deep level. For example, I teach a course at the University of Toronto, just wrapping it up, on the nature and function of the self. And the primary argument is that the cognitive science, the neuroscience, the philosophy, the psychology, are converging on the idea that the self is not a substantial thing, that it is inherently dynamical, relational kind of thing. And that that means the self is, the thing that was supposed to be the prototypical example of what a substance was doesn't actually serve that role, <laughs> which is very interesting. But the idea is we do carry around a deep cultural cognitive grammar of thinking of ourselves as that kind of thing and that actually severs us in some very important ways from a deep appreciation in all of the senses of the word of who and what we fundamentally are and how we are participating in the very flow of our being with ultimate uh, relationality and so this course will properly also challenge what it is you are to yourself and that relationship to yourself. And part of the core, the argument of the course is, of course, that the relationship to the ultimate will always carry with it a tremendous challenge to transform one's relationship to oneself. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time, John. Yes. Thank you. Johannes. You know how grateful I am to be doing this and be doing this with you. You're a good friend. And I deeply, I deeply believe you know this in the work you're doing. I believe in Halkian. I think it is towards the true, the good and the beautiful. I'm very happy to participate in it. And I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sean. That's uh, too kind. Uh, likewise, I, it's uh, wonderful to have you. And I look forward to spending so much time mm -hmm. listening to you and to the discussion that we all are going to have. So I will just be uh, listening for the eight uh, weeks, but I'll be taking notes myself and hosting. And um, I think this is one of the most exciting courses that we've had. It's very experimental. We'll see where it leads us. I think the discussions will probably, I reckon, will be very uh, lively. Uh, and maybe even heated. The questions today were excellent. And I, so I hope that many of you, George, I hope that you can join us. Harris is here. He's already in the course. Great. Hi, Harris. Uh, and um, so, yeah, uh, George should join us. I hope that uh, Aaron can join us as well. 
hope I'm not forgetting anyone. Okay, um, so the link to enroll is in the description of this video. It's also here. And John, any closing remarks before we... Just thank you for everyone that showed up. I know this is odd hours and I appreciate your time. And um, I look forward to more of this kind of reflection and dialogue and dare I, I say it, dialogos um, in the upcoming course. So thank you everyone. Take care and goodbye. Bye John. Okay, just uh, briefly again, John has now had to leave. I would just like to encourage you all to uh, enroll and join us. I'll just go over the enrollment uh, page again one second if you could go to the link in the description of this video but also in the chat it takes you to this page and if you have time for at least let's say five live lectures and seminars then this the philosophical fellowship it is the one that you i think you should enroll in if you don't have time for the live lectures and seminars you can still get access to the recordings of the live lectures and so these will be behind a paywall and by enrolling you help John and myself and the entire Halkion uh, enterprise to continue its work so consider every enrollment is also uh, equivalent to patronage to the work of Halkion if you We've added a couple more because there's been so much interest. If you want to take a private session with John Verveki, then this is for you. There's two more of this now available. If you'd like to join us for the Philosophical Fellowship, there's a payment plan here. Um, so that gives you access to everything from here. Now... <laughs> Yes, okay, so George is saying that he's in between Kant and this one. So there's also a Kant course, but now we're really focusing only on, on uh, Reveki's course. And um, I think if for anyone else who's maybe thinking about either doing Kant or this one or doing whichever one, um, the Kant course will be very text-based. So we'll be going along on in the text. And it's a decision that you have to make whether you think where you benefit the most from being in a classroom with someone. So that's um, uh, that's your uh, choice to make. So thank you all very much for being here and I hope to see you next week on the 5th of April when we begin with this course. Thank you.